So, as we mentioned just moments ago, uh, tributes are continuing to pour in for the late Congressman John Lewis, and this is a George as Georgia's Democratic Party has to do the work of looking to fill his seat. Um, the 80-year-old civil rights icon died Friday night after a six-month battle with pancreatic cancer. And House Speaker Nancy Pelosi spoke about Lewis earlier on CBS This Morning. I served with him for 33 years in the Congress of the United States. And he, uh, again, challenged our conscience in so many ways uh, in terms of equality and justice. And it was justice for all. Of course, he made his mark for equality in the South and voting rights uh, but it, it, for the African-American community. But he went well beyond that. He stood with us when we introduced the Equality Act, which was to uh, end discrimination against the LGBTQ community. He stood with us when we were talking about uh, uh, women's rights and the everything that that involves. Uh, he stood with us when we passed the Affordable Care Act. And it saddens me to say that when he was helping us with that, uh, that was 2010, there were people who were picketing uh, the Capitol. And, and they—now, uh, this is only 2010, this, that recently. That recent, uh, they shouted profanities at him. They they spat on him 10 years ago. Mm. So there's something that, mm. you know, our work has not been done. But the, what, the most wonderful thing that I love about the very end of his life, the last really public appearance that he made was to go and identify with Black Lives Matter painted on the street with the mayor of Washington, D.C. All right, so for more on this, we want to bring in Nancy Cordes. Um, you are at Capitol Hill. Nancy, uh, you covered uh, Congressman, Congressman Lewis for years and years and years. And I thought what was sort of interesting about what Nancy Pelosi um, kind of touched on a little bit in that, in that brief comment was um, the relevancy that he has had from one decade to the next, to the next, to the next, all the way um, to now within the civil rights movement. And his, you know, what he's done politically aside, um, I thought it was really sort of touching and moving uh, what Nancy Pelosi had to say. But when you think about the man and his legacy and covering him for all these years, what comes to mind for you? Well, I think, first and foremost, the fact that he was so beloved and admired uh, by lawmakers of, of all stripes, from uh, freshmen, members of Congress, all the way up to the Speaker of the House. You know, you saw Speaker Pelosi get choked up in that clip you just played. I can't remember the, to the, the last time that she uh, showed that kind of emotion and vulnerability in public. It just goes to how strongly she felt about John Lewis, and she said that she uh, spoke to him the day before he died, and that he was still uh, completely sharp, that they were uh, gossiping, but that he also knew that the end was near, and in fact, that's uh, why he wanted to speak with her. You know, John Lewis was someone who came here to Congress without anything to prove. He had already cemented his place in history. So he wasn't seeking the spotlight the same way that so many other lawmakers are because they need to. Uh, he understood the power of the spotlight. He understood when to seize it and when it would help his cause. But he was just as comfortable sharing it with others. And I can't tell you how many lawmakers I've spoken to just this weekend who said that his humility is really what they loved the most about him. Not you know, the, the fact that he was this iconic hero, yes, of course, but the fact that despite his, uh, his status as a, a, a key figure in the civil rights movement, he was still so humble and so happy to let them bask in that glory and to, to raise them up when he felt that they had done something worthy of notice. And Nancy, one of the things that I always admired Congressman Lewis for was his ability to reach across the aisle, but not in a political manner. What I, what I guess I'm trying to say is that um, there were so many members of Congress, both Democrat and Republican, who absolutely loved Congressman Lewis because he, 
I know that a lot of uh, the tributes this weekend have been around the civil rights movement, but he fought for all Americans regardless. In other words, he fought for all Americans who were downtrodden, who felt as if they were not getting their due in our society. In fact, in a uh, Boston Globe uh, op-ed a few years ago, he wrote, I fought too long and too hard against discrimination based on race and color, not to stand up against discrimination based on sexual orientation. So it wasn't just African Americans, it was white Americans, it was gay Americans, LGBTQ, fought for everybody. And you spoke to several lawmakers over the weekend about Congressman Lewis, including Georgia Representative Hank Johnson. And I want to just play a little bit of that interview. When he really wanted to, to be emphatic about something, his voice, uh, he would rise his voice and he would sound like, you know, he would sound like God from heaven. Do you think that's why he got the nickname, the conscience of Congress? That name um, w was uh, so appropriate uh, because when John Lewis speaks, uh, people listen. And, and so that, I guess, was sort of, I, I know I was trying, trying to put a fine point on it, Nancy, but I was just trying to sort of give people the sense that everybody in this country, he saw them as uh, folks that he wanted to elevate in any way that he could, which he saw um, echoed with his fellow members of Congress. Right. He really walked the walk. You knew exactly where he stood on every issue. He wasn't playing games. Um, yes, he was a very liberal member of Congress. That was a given. But he also, many members have said, really seemed to transcend politics. He had relations with members, relationships with members of the other side. And in that way, he sort of follows in, in the footsteps of some of these other recently departed giants of Congress, like John McCain or uh, John Dingell or Elijah Cummings, who just passed away a few months ago. There are precious few of these kinds of lawmakers who have this elevated status here, who um, you know are, are so deeply respected by members from both sides. And so in that way, it really is a, a tremendous loss here in Congress. I think one of the things that's been so moving, Vlad and Anne-Marie, is to talk to African-American lawmakers in particular who say that they feel that they owe their position in Congress to Lewis himself, that it was his bravery on those freedom rides and marching for voting rights that, you know, you can really draw a direct line between him putting himself in harm's way, getting beaten, getting arrested, and them being able to win their elections and come to Congress. So at the same time that they had this, this uh, devotion to him, this gratitude towards him, he also took them under his wing. I'm thinking of Terry Sewell in particular, who came from Selma, Alabama. You know, she grew up as a young girl, really idolizing John Lewis, only to uh, eventually come to Congress and have him serve almost as a father figure to her. Um, you know, saying that, that they have so, they they owe so much to him, and now they feel that it is incumbent upon them to carry out that legacy, to continue pushing for voting rights, for equal rights, uh, because that is the fight that uh, he, in many ways, started, and it's a fight, uh, clearly, that is not over. Um, so it is impossible to fill the shoes of an icon, but someone will have to fill his vacant seat, and that is uh, the work that the Democratic Party is, is looking to now. Um, so what do we know about who may be a replacement for him? Right, well, this is pretty remarkable because, as you know, the, the election is coming right up in November, and so there's not much time to lose. And so Georgia's De Democratic Party is meeting today. They say they are going to announce their nominee uh, for uh, to fill his, his spot on the ballot come November by this afternoon. And there uh, is fierce competition. You've got more than 100, 100 people who have uh, thrown their hats into the ring. Uh, and, and first, the party will narrow it down to three to five individuals, and then they'll, they'll eventually name their pick. And, um, you know, you've got some pretty illustrious names just on the selection committee, the mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms. You've got the former gubernatorial candidate, Stacey Abrams from Georgia, and Jimmy Carter's grandson. They're all going to be 
meeting today and they're going to hash this out. And so uh, even before the the nation, Congress, Atlanta have, have really had a chance to, to pay tribute to John Lewis, the party uh, recognizes how key this, this seat will be and they're looking to fill it as quickly as possible. Uh, and Nancy, before you go, I sort of have uh, two questions. They're very different, but I, I just, I got to uh, let people know that there's this video that circulated across social media this weekend after Congressman Lewis passed, and it video that you shot of him dancing uh, enthusiastically, Congressman Lewis, dancing enthusiastically to Pharrell's Happy. Um, he, he loved that song. I've seen other videos of him dancing <laughs> to it, but the one that you shot was incredible, and I posted it on my, on my Twitter uh, feed, and it got the most retweets and likes of anything else I posted about Congressman Lewis, um, which was remarkable. And the reason I bring that up, Nancy, is because of the coronavirus, we're not really able to do anything special or significant the way we normally would do when somebody of his stature has passed. Um, so I don't know what you've heard about any kind of, of plans for memorial service. But more importantly, the work of the Congress goes on. And we know that there is a, a negotiation happening on a new coronavirus stimulus relief package. So it's sort of right. two prongs here. The first, sure. the video that you shot, which was incredible. <laughs> and I guess what you're hearing about this uh, relief package package. Sure. I mean, I can't help smiling every time I see the video because uh, it was just so startling to see this 78-year-old civil rights icon just really getting down and, frankly, showing up the youngs uh, who were dancing with him because he just had had those moves. Look at that. Um, and and he, he sprung up because we were waiting for a political rally in Atlanta to get underway. And it was kind of, it was dragging on. It hadn't started. People were getting restless. And so he just thought, you know, well, I'll keep the I'm occupied, and I'll, I'll, I'll dance for them at the age of, 80, of 78, uh, I might add. So, uh, so that was really a, a neat moment. Um, as far as a, a tribute to him here at the Capitol, uh, yes, we do not know whether, in fact, he will lie in state. I asked Speaker, Speaker Pelosi about that this morning. She was noncommittal, uh, and she said that his family really wants to keep plans for uh, his memorial services under wraps until the Reverend C.T. Vivian, who passed away on the very same day, also from Atlanta, until he can be laid to rest on Thursday. So those plans are still uh, somewhat up in the air. Uh, obviously, uh, Lewis is someone who many lawmakers believe should lie in state here at the U.S. Capitol, but that's complicated by the fact that the Capitol is closed to visitors right now. So how exactly do you, you do that? There's not even a, a space here at the U.S. Capitol big enough to hold all members of Congress with proper social distancing, let alone uh, members of the, of the public. And so uh, that is a really complicated challenge, logis log logistical challenge, for leaders as they try to figure out how to pay tribute to this really uh, singular figure in American history. And real quick, Nancy, uh, what are you hearing about this negotiation on the coronavirus stimulus relief package? <sighs> Well, yeah, that's a heavy lift as well, and lawmakers are just now getting back after a couple of weeks away. Uh, Democrats have wanted to begin this negotiation for a while. Republicans have held off. Uh, we know that uh, Republicans in the Senate are hoping to put the finishing touches on their plan, which is um, much more modest than the, than the uh, multi-trillion dollar package that House Democrats passed uh, many weeks ago. But uh, Senate Democrats are incre increasingly suggesting that they're going to try to block that bill and force Senate Republicans to negotiate directly with Democrats first. They think that the, uh, that the stimulus package should be much more robust. And so this is really the week where we're going to see some of these very thorny issues, Vlad, get uh, hammered out, things like uh, unemployment insurance, another round of stimulus checks, uh, all of these areas where there, um, you know, th there's really been quite a, quite a bit of distance between the the two sides, but time is really running short. Those increased unemployment payments, for example, are set to run out in a little over a week at this point. So they, they don't have much time to find a middle ground. All right, Nancy Cordes for us on Capitol Hill. As always, Nancy, we thank you very much. You're welcome.